Anyway, so here we go. Hey, last week, guys, we started talking about gaps. And, uh, and we said last week, it's not the 90s clothing store, not the space between my teeth. We're talking about the gaps between our lives and the world, between the cares and the cravings and the carnality of our environment and who we are as children of God. And to be honest, because I want to be honest, right, but in full disclosure, maybe is a better way to say it, in full disclosure, these are not my favorite types of sermons. Because if I'm not careful, I, I think about it, and I'm like, okay, well, is this more like a 25-minute self-help thing? And that, that's, that's, I would rather talk about, you know, the, God's glory and power and passion and, and forgiveness and revival and the commission and, and all of those things. So I really, so I thought about just not finishing it this week, and then I was, I was kind of convicted because the truth of the matter is, that we have to have this in our hearts to prepare us for revival. It's great to talk about revival, but there's also some preparation work that has to happen in the church so that we can properly steward what's about to happen. Revival is about an awakening in the church, right? Judgment begins at the house of God. And I can't wait until revival really sweeps through our community and, there, and there's like lines of sinners ready to say the sinner prayer, right? Like, like we just got to like keep a, a, a you know, tub full of water to baptize people, right? Because they're just rolling through. I'm looking forward to that. I do believe, though, that even before that happens, the stage before that is an awakening in the church where we awaken to our identity as children of God to understand who we are, the, the access that we have, the power we have, the, the commission that we're under, the love of God, the fear of the Lord. And when those things start happening, the church starts moving forward first. Now, we're going to drag other people along with us, right? But the church starts moving forward first. That means the church. That means our families. That means us individually. We start moving forward first. And what we can't do is be tied to something that's anchored or going the wrong direction. So if we're going to move in revival, then we've got to mind the gap. And that's where the gaps come in. It's a purposeful separation between the church and the world. A purposeful separation between uh, the sacred and the secular and between the holy and the common. See, it, it's clear that there has to be a separation between what's sinful and what's holy. That, that, that's easy, right? We can, we can talk about that all the time, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is great at convicting us of those things, right? But, but there's also a separation that must happen between what is holy and what is common. So, so you've got things that are sinful, and that, that's in its own, you know, its own category, right? And there has to be a separation between that stuff and what's holy. There also has to be a separation between what's just common and what's holy. It's a huge, huge topic in the Old Testament. It was really the, and we could go into a, a lot of the things, but it was the reason for the tabernacle. It was a reason for the temple and the layout. You know, the, the, God told the priest, especially in, in Ezekiel and all through the Old Testament, he says, look, look here, priest, what you have to do, part of your commission is to teach my people to discern the difference between the holy and the common. There's that separation. And so we've got to mind the gap, not just with things that are sinful, because that's usually pretty easy to see. We have to mind the gap between the holy and the common. And that means not just keeping a gap, but keeping the proper size. Right? We have to pay attention to it and make sure that it, it exists and that it's sized properly. Last week, we talked about gaps in relationships. And we used 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 is a springboard for this. You, you guys probably remember this scripture. It just says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And it says it all right there. Right? Don't be tied together with someone who does not believe. It doesn't mean, you know, don't be close to them. Because the same guy that wrote this said, you know, I've become all things to all people so that I may win some of them, right? But it says, don't be tied to them. Don't be yoked together. That's where you got to have the gap. For what for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what do fellow or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? 
of what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them, and, they'll walk, and I'll walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. Therefore, verse 17 says, Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Last week we talked about gaps in relationships. So here we go, super quick recap. When we talk about gaps in relationships, we talk about gaps between us and non-Christians. And this seems so easy, right? Because the Bible says it right there. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers, right? So you've got to have that gap. That's easy. The hard part is knowing how big a gap. And we talked about that a little bit last week, but it takes discernment. And it takes some wisdom and the Holy Spirit, right? Because it, you, you, can't be, you can't be joined together with them or they're going to stop you. They're going to slow you down. You're going to end up going the wrong direction. But you can't be so far removed from them that you can't influence them. And it's tough. We talked about all that last week, so I won't go through it again. But, but just know that, man, the gaps in relationships, especially gaps with non-Christians, very important to mind the gap, to pay attention to it. Gaps with toxic people. We talked about that again last week, right? And this one, again, it seems pretty easy because, you know what, it, it's clear that we don't need to be tied with people that are dragging us down, right? Toxic folks, man, you don't, you don't want that, right? Because, because we're going to live in the blessing of the Lord. We're going to live in, in, in the promises of God, and we don't need anybody else speaking death over us, right? We're going to turn our ears against those things, and we're going to walk in life. It seems very easy, except... Some people that are toxic to what we're trying to do are people that we love. Maybe family members. You know, last week we talked about uh, David and Absalom. That's a messed up story, right? It's tough. What do we do? What do we do when toxic people are people that, that we, we love because they're our family? Or, or, we go to, or we go to church with them, right? Because not all Christians are you know, uplifting and positive. How do we deal with that? And so we mind the gap. You have to keep a gap because you can't be pulled down by that, but you can't be so far separated that, that you can't let love overcome those things. And it takes wisdom, and it takes minding the gap. There has to be a gap, but you've got to mind it. We talked about gaps in growing, in growing relationships. This is going to be very important. This is very important for us right now. It's going to become even more important in the future as as our influence in the city grows, right? Because as, as revival is poured out, right, as people come in and, and get saved and, and, man, they're getting their lives cleaned up, uh, we're going to have more influence in the city, more influence in, in the neighborhoods, right? We're going to know more people, and we're going to have a lot of growing relationships. The catch is that you've got to mind the gap because when you're first starting a relationship, you don't really know. If you're on the same page with them in every way, this goes for friendships, it goes for discipleship relationships, it certainly goes for romantic relationships, right? When you're first getting to know somebody, you don't know if you're on the same page, so you've got to mind the gap, and it can be very hard. It can be very hard, especially with romantic relationships. I met Candace when we were both seniors in high school, and I did not want to get stuck on a girl because I was thinking, hey, we're graduating, I'm leaving, she's leaving. Right, we're going our separate ways. But man, she's cute. Oh, my goodness. And so it can be hard to keep that separation, right? But, but you've got to mind the gap in growing relationships and be led by the Holy Spirit and not by emotions or hormones or anything else. Right? You've got to mind the gap. You've got to mind the gap with slow people. This is just, I'm just kind of skipping through what we talked about last week, right? We talked about it for a long time. You can go back and listen to it if you want, but... But there are some people in our lives that are moving with us but are not moving at the same speed. And this is where we're, this is going to get real tricky in the church world as revival starts, right? Because in the end, I would say, not 100%, unfortunately, but like, I don't know, maybe like 93.2% of the churches out there are moving in a good direction. They really want the things of God. Now, some of them don't, and, and okay, fine, right? Judgment begins with the house of God. But then some do. They want to do what's right, but they're not going to embrace.
embrace the things of God as quickly as others. That happens in the church world. It will happen as revival is poured out. It happens at home a lot. And this is something else we're going to have to deal with as we more and more people get saved, right? The husband's going to get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. The wife's not going to want to do church as hardcore as he does or the other way around. The wife, the kids, whoever else, man, they're all in, but not everybody is. And so, okay, but, but, but you're stuck together, right? Absolutely, right? You, because, because you can't break that bond, but so you have to move in the same direction. You still want to move fast, but, but you got to, uh, it's tough. And you got to mind the gap. Minding the gap doesn't just mean create a separation and, and go. No, it means pay attention to it. So, so what we said last week, you know, when, when, when you're tied together with someone that, that, that doesn't want to move as quickly, right, we, it takes a lot of wisdom in the Holy Spirit, a lot of revelation to know, okay, I've got to create just a little bit of separation so I can still go fast, but, but not, as, not so much separation that I'm going to leave somebody behind. And it's tough. It's real tough. This week I was, I was reading, and, and I saw the first psalm, and I thought, man, it fits so great in this series. So before we go to the, the next points, let's read this. This is amazing. Uh, the first Psalm, uh, beginning verse 1, says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do, prospers. And I love the end of that. Whatever they do prospers. Because when true revival comes, I'm telling you guys, it's going to impact every every aspect of your life. It's going to impact your home, your family, your job, your schedule, your finances. It's going to impact everything. Which takes us to the rest of the sermon because if we're really going to prosper in all things, we're going to have to mind the gap in all things. And again, it's the gap not just between the, the sinful and the righteous because that's easy, but, but between the holy and the common. Number two, the roles we play or the hats we wear, whichever way you want to look at it. We have to maintain a gap between the holy and the common in the roles that we play. If we're going to thrive in revival and have the maximum impact on our society and on our generations, we've got to mind the gap in the roles that we play. Now, very important here. I'm not talking about identities. Okay? Uh, if you're at church, you're a child of God. If you're at work, you're a child of God. If you're sitting in traffic, you're a child of God. If you're at a restaurant with your kid who's screaming about a volcano onion at crazy hibachi not that, that ever happened to me but you're a child of god right no matter where you are or what you're doing you are a child of god you hear the voice of god you speak the word of god that that is your identity and that does not change but the roles that we play shift a little bit and in those roles it's important for us to maintain the gap between the holy and the common Again, guys, I would much rather, like, starting next week, we're going to start talking about uh, soul winning, and, and like, we're going to talk about some, some really great stuff as we go through this, uh, this series, and I love that kind of stuff. These kind of sermons, not my favorite, but it's so very important because if we're going to be ready for what's coming, we've got to figure this out. We've got to mind the gap in the roles that we play. What do I mean by that? We've got to mind the gap between school and work and our professional lives and all of those things and, and what we do at home and what we do at church. When you're at work, you're a child of God. Point. End. Period. Like that's your identity. But you're also there to work. We talked about this a little bit on, on Wednesday when we were looking through Colossians. And a lot of years ago, we had a, a lady that was working with us um, where I work, and we couldn't get her to do anything. And she was just wasn't very productive, except she kept this, this big Bible on her desk. 
and like a lot of times in the middle of the day, man, she'd be like, you know, writing stuff out like Sunday school stuff or Bible study stuff. Man, that's awesome. Except you're not getting anything done. And that's kind of a bad look on Christianity, right? And, man, do that at lunch. Praise God. Show everybody. Like, I mean, you know, that's fine. On your time, do that. Before, you know, come early to the office and pray. I'd love for you to do that. But otherwise, I need stuff done. And it's a bad look for Christianity. And so here's the thing, guys. And again, this is going to get more and more complicated as, as we really are moving in revival. Because I'm telling you, you're going to have a hunger for God like you've never had before. And what we can't do is compromise our identity. Man, you're a child of God here. You're a child of God there. But you've got to have the gap in the roles that you play. Here's what, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. I think this is related for sure. And he's talking about the city on a hill thing, right? So Matthew 5, 15 and 16. He says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Right? That means that, that whatever you put your hands to do, let it be done to glorify God. Between work or school or whatever it is, mind the gap okay, and be good at what you're doing at that time. At home, mind the gap. When you're at work, work. Be intense about it. I used to tell everybody, mo model compartmentalized intensity, right? So when you're at work, work. When you're at home, don't. Be at home. Because I know there's a lot of pressure. And I, I think everybody in here, like, if, you, if you've got a job, you've got a high-stress situation at some point. Some jobs are probably a little more laid back than others. But I can tell you, probably at least once a week, you've had a rough day at the office or a rough day at school. And then the commute home is horrible. And somebody's, like, you know, trying to cut you off. And, like, by the time you get home, you're still fuming. It's rough. But remember that your family time is sacred. And again, what we're talking about is the gap between the holy and the common. Your home should be a sanctuary. That's the gap between the holy and the common. And by the way, I'll tell you this, as revival spreads, it's not going to be just all like, woo, daisies and, and bunny rabbits, right? It's going to be tough. As, as the church gets hotter and the world is still cold, there's going to be a bigger, there's going to be a bigger gap between what we're doing and what the world is doing, which means that there's going to be more opportunity for persecution. Like, we're not on the same page. So what that means is that some of the stuff that you're going to face at work that's hard now is going to be harder then. Some of the stuff you face at school that's hard now is going to be harder then. So when you come home, change hats, change roles, keep the separation between the holy and the common, because I, I can't stress this enough. If we're going to be successful in leading generations, our generations, right, then we have to make our home a sanctuary, so you have to keep the gap. Okay? The difference between family and ministry roles, that's another gap you've got to... Okay? This is... This is <laughs> I like both of these hats, but you've got to keep them separate. Guys, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm in a room full of pastors and preachers and teachers and evangelists and, and people that are gifted in healing. Because I tell you what, the part of, of this church, right, the folks that have come in, like, you guys, you got a call on your life. Like, this is this just part of it. It's, it's who God is bringing in at this moment. I think he's preparing us for something huge. But that means that, that you guys, you, you are, are ministry-minded and, and, and you're going to be ready to, to get in there and, and to, to work and to serve and all of those things. But, but it's also going to be easy for us to get stuck in that role of ministry. And that's, it's great to be there. That, that's a holy offering. But, but it's a different role than being mom or dad or husband or wife. And those things, I'd say, are probably even more sacred. If you have to choose, right, you've got to you got to be the priest over your home, and then you can be the, the minister to the to 
the masses, guys. And, and again, I, I love the idea of, of revival. I, I love the idea that, you know, I was talking on Wednesday night, and I said, you know, I, I personally like being bivocational, but I can't wait until there's, there's a power of the Holy Spirit so that, so that you know what? That I can just devote myself to doing this, and I'll do that 100%. I'll give up the role of, of the work that I do to do ministry. But you know what I can't do? I can't give up the role of being a husband and a father to do the work of ministry. And the people that have been tempted to do that over the years always end up backsliding. Okay? So, again, this isn't like a shouting service, right? We'll get to that maybe next week. Like We'll talk about winning souls. It'll be awesome, right? But for today, just, just learn this. There has to be a gap the ministry you do, right, and who you are at the house. Those, those, are, those are different hats, right? When we get busy leading generations, guys, we have to mind the gap between the call of ministry and the commission to lead our families. I know way too many ministers that have led crowds but lost their children. I know, I know, I know may, way, way too many preachers who couldn't stop being pastor long enough to be dad or husband, and, and in Part of that's time management, and that, that's fine. We'll, we'll talk about that maybe later. But, 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 but part of that is that they couldn't separate themselves from the roles. And so you've got to, from a role perspective, right? and again, I'm sorry if this sounds like a, a self-help thing. It's really not. This, this is preparing us for revival. You have to separate what's holy from what's common. And there's got to be a gap between all the roles that you play. Whether you're going to work, is there a part of that that's holy and, and offering to God? Absolutely. Right? But it's a different role than, than when you're at the home. And that's a different role than when you're doing ministry. And, and in every one of those, you've got to just separate. So that's that. Okay, uh, next and last, resources. There's a lot I could say here, honestly. There's a, but, um, but when we talk about resources, there's really just two. That, like of all the things that we could think of, there's really just two main categories of resources, and that's time and money. Everything else usually kind of fits in there somewhere. But time and money, right? This is related to stewardship, but but not only. It's about maintaining a gap between the holy and the common. Let's talk about time first, because that's kind of related to the, the roles that we just talked about. We have common time, right? And the vast majority of our lives are common not sinful, but common. You know, you, you're eating, you're sleeping, you're working, you're driving, you're in the car line waiting to pick up kids forever. You know, whatever it is that you're doing, right, it, it's fine. You're, that, that's life, and you're living it, and, and that's great, right? It can also be draining. So we have to have a separation of some of our time that then becomes holy time. Because there has to be a separation between the holy and the common couple of examples. One of these is our worship time. It's so very important. It's very important now. It will be more important as we are strained by revival. Revival is not easy. It's great, but it's not easy. Our schedules get stretched. So, make time to go to church. Preach to the choir, you're at church. <laughs> right? But make time for it. No matter where you are, you know, 10 years from now, you move somewhere, whatever it is, make time to go to church, to be here among God's people. You got an ox in the ditch? Okay, I get it, man. You're on vacation? Fine, skip. But if you're, if you're available, go to church. Be among God's people. Right? I want you to come here because I, lo I love here, right? But, but wherever it is, wherever you go, get in and be among God's people. Because that, and set aside that time is God's time, right? Sunday morning, Wednesday evenings, whatever it is, set aside that time as holy and don't let anything come against it. What about worship time? So very important. We'll talk about worship at church. Okay. Make time to worship God. Do you need to serve? Yes. Do you also need to worship 
right now, like, I mean, this is a small crew, so we can kind of, like, we all just kind of do our own, you know, like, we all pitch in and help, and, you know, you back in, somebody else will start coffee, and, you know, get the track, whatever, right, there's going to come a time, because, again, what I'm, what I'm thinking today is that, that this is a preparation moment for in the future when we're really experiencing revival, and we've got, a, like, people coming in, and so, man, we're busy, like, like, like we're pulling a, you know, Mary and Martha, we're pulling a Martha kind of thing, where we're running around getting stuff done. And then when worship starts, you get a thousand things running through your brain, right? Everything from, okay, you know, did, did I set everything up right? Or is the kids' church ready to go? Is the nursery, you know, doing okay? Did I turn the coffee pot off? Did I leave the heater on in the back? I mean, just all of that stuff is running through your brain. And then you're also thinking about, okay, well, what happens after this? You know, okay, I've got to get all these people to lunch. Maybe we've got a, a bus ministry because I can't wait to have a bus ministry. And you're like, okay, i got to get all these people home, and then i still got to go meet some people for lunch. And you've got all this stuff. separation between the holy and the God. There has to be a moment at church where you say, okay, and we used to do this all the time in youth group, you guys probably remember, where you imagine a, a line just in the sand. You say, you know what? All of that stuff, even the stuff that's good because I'm serving, it's over here. And just for a minute, for 15 minutes, for 20 minutes, I'm going to step across this line and I'm going to find myself in the presence of God. We've got to have that kind of separation, that time separation in our worship. These, these minutes, they're sacred, and nothing's going to distract me for these minutes. That happens at church, by the way. That should happen at your house, too. I've got a, I've got a meeting on my calendar. It's, uh, uh, it's meeting, uh, what is it, uh, MW... Letters I used, but it's the meeting with the Most High, and it's every morning. It's on my calendar from six fifteen to six thirty. Okay. Do I do that every day? Eh, no, most days, yeah. And I tried to separate that out, right? So I'm not answering emails. I'm not doing anything else for that time. I'm trying to pray, read the Word. You know, it's not that it's not that long, but it's separate. Guys, we've got to do that with our time. You got to find 15 minutes. You, you got to find 10 minutes. You got to find five minutes. Whatever it is, and say, at this moment, I'm going to meet with you. And then stuff happens, right? But set it aside. Set aside ministry time. Now, not the same as worship time. Okay? But remember, we're here to know God, right? To live in fullness and to be the difference. And sometimes being the difference means doing things in ministry that, you know, sometimes you don't want to do. And ministries work sometimes. It, it's an offering to God. And so it, instead of just, you know, letting life happen and then trying to find an excuse to not do that, because you can probably do that, set aside that time as something that's sacred. Setting aside your time. It, it's gapping out your resources, and the resource of time very, very important. You don't get any more of that. I can make more money, right? You can't make more time. Family time. Set it aside. It goes along with the roles. We talked about that a few minutes ago. But please, please, please set out some family time, whether it's dinner, whatever else, set it aside. And again, guys, I, I mean, I, I'd rather like, you know, have a Jericho march and talk about something, but, but, but right now we've got to prepare for what's coming. Right? And what's coming is a revival that's going to mess with our schedules. And if we don't have these ideas of separation, right, then, then trials and tribulations and busyness is going to disqualify us from some of the plans. Okay? Set aside your family time. Set aside a date night. I love date night. It happens like once every eight months with us, but whatever. Right? Set aside some time because it's important. Last but not least, when we talk about resources, we're talking about money, right? So time and money, those are things that, that everything else kind of falls in those categories. Right? I, I don't typically talk about money. Like, I just don't. Like, uh, part of that is because, you know, we've all seen people in, in churches kind of abuse the subject, and, and they've got selfish motives and things like that. So, but Jesus talked about it a lot, and so I probably should more, to be honest. In general, here's the way I see this going down, right? 
Ministry costs money. Revival is going to cost a lot of money. So, God's going to supply. How's He going to do that? I think He's going to do it in two ways. One way is He's going to bring in people that's just got a lot of money. Right? The other thing He's going to do is He's going to prosper us. I, I, I do believe that. Right? There's the principle of stewardship. And I'm telling you, man, God is going to pour out on us blessing, financial blessing. Okay? And in order to make sure that we really do prosper in that and don't become overwhelmed by it, we have to have this gap of the holy and the common. Now, does, does God bless us for our own benefit? Yeah, I think God wants to make us happy, right? I, 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 think, I don't think God has any, any problems with us going out and buying something that we like, right? I think that's awesome, and I think he's blessing us with that. I also think that, that if we're really going to do this well, then we've got to have that separation to say, okay, God, well, you know, this isn't bad, it's, but it's common. And this part, this tithe, or this offering on top of that, or the, the commitments that we made for missionaries, whatever it is, right, this is holy. And I'm not going to mix these two. And this is going to be tough, right? It's, it, it's going to be tough because, you know, we're going to be faithful in the little things. We're going to be faithful in the big things. We're also going to have to teach these principles to people that come in that haven't ever heard these principles before. But we set aside what's holy and what's common. And we say, God, this is yours. This is going to your house. This is going to your ministry. This is going to your plans. And then everything else, thank you for that. And I'm going to use this as my heart desires according to your will. But there's a gap, and they don't cross. There's a gap between the holy and the common. It's the idea of first fruits. Right? You set aside what's holy and then everything else. Mind the gap. You know, it, it, I, I'm closing. <laughs> we say, Courtney, right? Courtney. <laughs> it's tough because... It's clear that a passion for Jesus and true revival is going to impact every part of your life. Like, it's going to mess with everything, and that's good. But then there's also this idea of a holy separation. That, okay, our identity changes, who we are changes, because now we're walking more in step with the Holy Spirit. The gifts that we have flow out of us, but there's still this idea of a gap. Gap in our relationships and gaps in our roles and gaps in our resources. And, and if we're going to, to maximize the, in, the impact of the Spirit inside of us and really walk in step in wisdom, then we're going to have to figure out how to navigate this, and it's, it's not going to be super easy. But it's something that is super necessary. So how do we do it? Well, um, I have a couple of thoughts. And uh, it always goes back to prayer and Bible study. That's just kind of the way most things in Christianity go. The more you know the Word of God, the deeper your roots are, the more you're going to be able to see examples of how to keep things separate. The more you pray and learn to hear His voice, the more you're able to hear His direction. Right, the revealed word. And then there's this great story, and you guys know it, about you know when, when Solomon was becoming king, and he said, man, God, this, this looks pretty hard. And God says, well, okay, well, what can I do for you? Ask me anything. And Solomon was like, oh, snap. Um, how about some wisdom? Because that's what I'm going to need to govern your people. And God's like, you asked right. He gave him wisdom and so many other things. When we talk about how to have gaps, and I mean, these are this tough stuff, relationships, roles, right, it, which, I mean, that gets mixed up, you know, resources, time, money, all those things, it can be tough. What are we going to leave here today doing? We're going to leave here today asking God for wisdom to do it well. And from that, everything else will prosper. 